Our next presenters are Sharon Darafondeth and Nicole Penditi, um, coming from UC Berkeley, just up the street. So Sharon is the interim director of the Student Environmental Resource Center at the University of California, Berkeley. She oversees over 15 programs and services working to affect meaningful change on campus, including the Zero Waste Research Center, the Green Initiative Fund, and Environmental Justice Political Advocacy Initiative. So prior to UC Berkeley, Sharon worked at the Sustainability Strategist for San Francisco State University. And Nicole Panditi is president of Bee Makerspace uh, and an undergraduate research lead specializing in 3D printing at UC Berkeley. She is passionate about designing a custom recycling solution to UC Berkeley that leverages the unique waste stream and plastic consumption patterns. So Sharon and Nicole will present UC Berkeley students make zero waste possible. Please welcome. Hello, good morning everyone. Um, so I think it's safe to say that we all understand the concept of journey. When we think about products, we think about the amount of energy that goes into that product, uh, what bin it gets placed into, where does it go after that bin, is it going into the landfill, how long is that product going to be sitting in a landfill, if it's in a recycling bin and goes into a recycler, what type of material is it going to be made into. Um, and I want us to kind of maybe even dive a little deeper. What is our own personal journeys and when was it along our journey did we think about zero waste and that we wanted to commit ourselves and our lives to working around zero waste initiatives. Um, so a little bit about my journey. Uh, when I was a kid, um, I grew up in just a sustainable-minded household. Not because my parents believed in eco-friendly, but because it was cost-effective. So my father was a gardener. He grew up, um, he grew fruit trees in our backyards, built a greenhouse, all produce um, was created in our backyard. This is a photo of me next to one of my favorite fruit trees, which is a Granny Smith apple tree. Um, and so these are the things that, and everything we did was really zero waste. We reused so many materials. We wore things as long as we could um, because it was cost effective. And so I kind of grew up living in a zero waste lifestyle. And I brought that with me when I was in school. I actually, I went to SF State, go Gators. Um, and I was, worked really hard as a young environmental um, activist. I tried institutionalizing change on my own campus. Um, this is a photo of me with a zero, I started a zero waste bin monitoring program and teamed up with the class who the professor was able to provide extra credit to students to actually help bin monitor. And um, at the end of the semester, students would come and talk to me and they were like, they had the same frustrations that we did. Like, why aren't people sorting waste? Why is there so much waste generated? And these folks weren't even sustainability minded. So the power of youth is really important to me and working with college students is really important to me. And um, I am very privileged in the role that I get to be at UC Berkeley. Um, and zooming out a little, we even see the power of youth at a national level. Um, folks like Emma Gonzalez, who is at demanding stricter gun, gun legislation after the Parkland um, massacre in Florida. Um, even on a localized level, these two young women uh, are from Baltimore and they just passed a measure banning polystyrene. They're in high school. Uh. <laughs> and so bringing it back to UC Berkeley, um, we have a tremendous amount of passionate students who are really driving zero waste and change on our campus. Uh, the Green Initiative Fund is our campus sustainability grant program, which was created, um, voted on um, by students, and students are essentially taxing themselves $8 a semester that goes into this pool of grant funding that they can use and have access to to campus sustainability projects. Since its inception in 2008, we funded over $2.4 million worth of projects on campus, amounting over 190 projects. Half a million dollars of those projects have gone directly to zero waste initiatives. All, most of them implemented, driven, and created by students. Um, so here are a few of them that I'm gonna go over and then I'll pass it over in, to Nicole to talk about one of her projects. Um, so Compost Alliance was one of uh, our first projects that TGIF was able to fund and this was a group of students and they worked directly with Cal Zero Waste, our campus uh, department on institutionalizing and implementing uh, zero waste, uh, standardized zero waste bins in campus uh, academic buildings. And we're two years away from our 2020 goal and uh, we're hoping to expand uh, all of these bins into all academic buildings in the course of the next year. 
And this again was started and implemented and students directly worked with academic buildings and building manager, managers on getting this to happen. Um, expanding zero waste in residence halls. When I first started at Berkeley almost about four years ago, uh, it was over summer so I didn't get a lot of interaction with students but a the, some of the first students I met was down at Clark Kerr, one of our residential hall areas, and students were labeling recycling bins and compost bins with stickers, and they were just piloting um, compost and recycling in one of the res halls. And they wanted to show that students wanted this, that it can be effective and it can work. A year later, they applied for funding for TGIF and was able to get a grant uh, that supported the expansion of zero waste in all res halls. So now every single residential hall and dorm at UC Berkeley uh, has access to compost and recycling recycling and this again was one of those projects in collaboration with staff but students really drove this and made it happen. Um, Telegraph Green is another project and it's another group of students who aren't just focused on UC Berkeley ways but they're looking at the restaurant buildings outside um, of Berkeley specifically south side around Telegraph Avenue and trying to work with businesses um, and restaurants on taking a look closer at their packaging and trying to get them to offer discounts on reusables and these again are just another group of students non-paid they're a student organization really trying to change the culture of zero waste not just on campus but directly outside of campus. Um, Chu Hall Zero Waste is another project on campus and they are working on being one of the first academic buildings that would be certified zero waste and this was driven by a wonderful staff member and a graduate student and now there's a team of students trying to ensure that this building stays zero waste. This building currently has no landfill bins. It is all recycle bins and compost bins and the mentality is pack it in, pack it out. If you're bringing trash into this building, bring it out of the building and they've been quite successful so far in just the last year. Um, and I get the great opportunity of working um, and managing the Zero Waste Research Center, which is a team of undergraduate students who are working on upstream solutions towards zero waste. They're really focused on the circular economy of things, trying to figure out what, what products can we prevent on campus or what types of materials can we make with the things that we are currently discarding. And Nikki will touch base on that. So if you can't tell already, Sharon is one of the most supportive bosses that I could hope to work under. She really believes in the project that we're doing, and I'm excited to tell you a little more about it. So um, the project that I'm working on right now is a campus 3D printing waste recycling loop. Um, so for those of you who aren't as familiar with 3D printing, uh, the basic stock material is basically a string of plastic that's used and heated up and laid down in layers in order to create three-dimensional objects. So this is a really great system. It's very cool, very innovative, and very useful um, tool for education. But there's also a lot of waste sort of built into the process. Um, for example, as a novice uh, 3D printer, a person might see up to 50% of their 3D prints fail, at which point the machine malfunctions or it gets tangled, and that midway produced product has to be trashed. Um, in addition, 3D printing is a rapid prototyping process. And what that means is that a lot of the iterations that are made are not intended to be the final product. And so all of those, after being analyzed, will also be trashed. Um, and finally, sometimes there's just not enough uh, plastic left on a spool in order to do anything with it, and that is also waste. So what we have here is a surprisingly large and fast-growing unique waste stream on campus. UC Berkeley is producing uh, currently over 600 pounds of this plastic trash per year, and that number is only increasing as 3D printing becomes more popular. Um, so we decided to take a unique in-house recycling approach to this unique in-house waste stream. <coughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about the cycle that we've developed. We're very excited about it. Um, so on top, you'll see uh, a 3D print that's being made for one of those three reasons that I mentioned before, it gets trashed. And we've placed custom recycling bins all around campus near all of the 3D printing labs to make this really easy, and we've established the collection infrastructure. Then we take that to our grinder, grind it up, heat it up, and re-extrude it into the filament, spool it, and re-deliver it back to the same labs that it came from. Thank you. <laughs> so the reason that we're really excited about this process is because we saw an opportunity. The opportunity is that this is a less toxic plastic waste stream. It's PLA number seven, which is um, the bioplastic. 
um, so we can heat it safely as student workers. Um, not to mention it's not contaminated with any food. So to l allow this to just go into our traditional waste streams seemed like a waste when we could choose to recycle it back on the same level instead of downcycling. Um, so what we're facing right now is that Many student groups across the country who we work closely with have established pilot programs or research programs of this nature, but we want to be the first ones to successfully scale this up and handle the exact volume of plastic trash that we're generating on campus. So currently we've been going through grant processes, getting our equipment in order, now we have our equipment, getting our cert safety certifications in order. It's very exciting and if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up and ask me after. Mm, but I just wanted to share with you this project because it's a unique approach to handling our recycling and taking responsibility for our trash on campus. Thank you. Cool. Questions for Nicole and Sharon? Can't see anybody. Oh, there's a hand there. I think that's Martin. Yeah. Hi, Martin Bork, Ecology Center. Um, thanks for your great work on campus. Really excited to have um, CERC so involved in zero waste efforts, uh, both on and off campus. I had a question about the, um, how do you handle the different colors uh, of material and um, how much of what's being and the, I guess the feedstocks and all the different shops that might have 3D printers, how do you handle purchasing for the right kinds of plastics that you can then capture later? Yeah, that's a great question. So in terms of color, we pre-sort the waste streams um, by basic color. So you know, all of the like warm colors would go together so we don't just end up with a brown sludge filament every single time. But we are also looking at something kind of interesting, um, creating custom colors out of the primary colors in order for us to track how many times a polymer has been recycled. So for example, like there's no lavender filament being produced on campus. If we produce a lavender filament, we'll know that's gone through the process once and the polymer chains are a certain length because of that and then we could produce a secondary color out of that and really keep track of the cycles and know when it's time to add more virgin material and increase those material properties so that's something we're looking into um, the second question is we're only taking PLA number seven right now we're not taking ABS or any of those other ones if a lab is using that we're just not going to put a bin there because those are more toxic uh, when you heat them up and we're not prepared to handle that level. thanks yeah.